I did a costume change. <laughs> I live in the neighborhood, and I did it for a reason. I felt very Game of Thrones today. Um, my friend Richard Plepler just left HBO, so I'm doing this in honor of him. Um, but this is very Game of Thrones to me. But what I wanted to do is take it off dramatically, because the, when Lorraine and I, we went to Soul Cycle together. I'm not going to go into it, the details. <laughs> but she kicked my ass, let's just say. I was like, <laughs> like this, and she was like happily soul cycling away. Right. Um, First of all, I, I don't know that that's true. Secondly, what happens at Soul Cycle stays at Soul Cycle. Really? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. In any case, rules. I'm going to cut to the chase. Uh, she said she would come to this if she got a Lesbian Who Tech Squad sweatshirt. That's because um, you were wearing one. I was wearing one that said mm -hmm. badass inclusive. And so, if you look under your chair, Lorraine. Oh. <laughs> here, it's right here. Oh, oh excuse me, I'm being impolite. <laughs> There you go. I already love this um, interview. So, I know, this is a good interview already. So I'm going to take off my jacket in a dramatic way. <laughs> I'm going to put on my, this is Pia's wife's one. My two are at home. Um, so I'm now apparently married to Leanne, which is <laughs> disturbing in many ways. Um, and this is Lorraine. Thank you. Thank so Lorraine, you. you now have a badass inclusive sweatshirt um, oh, that you can wear, and I want you to wear it everywhere. All right, I'll start right now. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So we're gonna sit back, sit down. All right. Now you now you have 50% uh, more people to date. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God, because the other 50% aren't stepping up. All right. Okay. <laughs> They're fucking idiots, but then he will go into that. <laughs> so, clearly, hello. Um, so let's start talking about you and what you've been doing. Um, I wrote a column about Lorraine when she bought Pop-Up Magazine yeah. just recently, and, and there's a lot of very wealthy people, such as yourself, buying up media, but you've been doing it for a while. Let's start with that, and then mm -hmm. I want to talk about some of the other mm -hmm. things you're doing around art and activism um, and things like that. Okay. But let's start with media. Okay. You recently invested in Pop-Up. You've been doing, I want to talk about why you're doing it. You invested in The Atlantic magazine. You've been making an American journalism project for local media. Talk a little yeah. bit about why you're doing this. So, um, happily, uh, we started investing in nonprofit media many years ago, mm -hmm. uh, probably eight years ago. And then uh, because of the, the real decimation of the newsroom uh, across the country, both at the national level, but especially at the local level, um, and, and all of the, the data that is available to be seen is pretty uh, disturbing. And the balkanization of news and the polarization of news and the lack of ability for people to actually find relevant local news all is coming together uh, with these converging forces that are, that are I think, uh, putting our democracy at risk, putting our ability to converse with each other at risk, putting our ability to understand each other at risk. And so um, there were a number of really interesting journalists who started first issue area journals. Um, so, so for example, great education writers, great criminal justice writers, great environmental justice writers who started nonprofit journalism projects who we invested in. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had the, the great good fortune of some for-profit media entities, both at the startup level and, and those that existed for a long time, like The Atlantic, come to us because their business model is, is compressed and, and they need an influx of capital, and for me, um, it was a natural extension of of the entire field that we that we are. How do you invested. look at it? Because you have Mark and Mark Benioff, who is who's been here um, investing in time. time. You have mm -hmm. Jeff at the Washington Post. Yep. You have you, and there's going to be others, I think. Uh, how do you what, how do you look at it, and why do you see there's a lot of tech people doing this, or tech money and stuff like that? Yeah. What, what did you, what was the thing that got you to do it? Because it was oh here. Oh, no okay. Um, what was what got you to do this? What was the thing? Is it you thought that this was critical to democracy, or that you had an interest in media, or this? You have lots of subject areas, but this has been yeah. one that well, you've been we, focused on. Yeah, our our issue areas are those that we think are the most calcified and the most important that reflect the American values and that are important to democracy. So we work in education, we work in immigration, we work in environment. 
Um, and, and outside of that, it started to become really obvious to us that, that the cultural narrative, that the, that the, the kind of in-depth journalism that exposes the injustices in these fields was, was under attack from both a business model point of view. From the internet, from internet. Yeah, exactly, from, 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 from the access to a, abundant free news. Mm -hmm. um, and so the advertising model um, is no longer a viable model and the subscription-based model took a long time to, to concretize and take off. And so they're just, we, we lived in this time period for about a decade when we saw the collapse of, of, of credible, viable journalistic properties. Um, so for me, um, I actually was presented the opportunity. I, I didn't go out with the notion that I wanted to buy a property that that came to us right. um, from the owners. Do you? But you, you were present. You were presented with a lot of opportunities, presumably. Correct. Yeah, but not. I, I guess we were really specific about the type of high quality journalism that we are both consumers of that we think are really important to to have a foothold in such as local news um, or, or, or investigative news or things yes. like that. Yes. So and and what what. Kara mentioned the American Journalism Project is a brand new project that is um, that was started by the CEO of Texas Tribune and of Chalkbeat magazines, and it's a nonprofit model that will be sort of a venture fund for local newsrooms across the country, and they'll give both funding and technical assistance because and and back a lot of back end support that that local newsrooms can no longer use. Um, but organizations like the Texas Tribune have found uh, that having alternative revenue sources allows them to stay alive. So they have an amazing events business and they have uh, great podcasts and they have great in uh, investigative journalism that others buy, like ProPublica. But you don't see it as a, as a charitable thing because like, you know, is it a chair? Does it have to be supported by incredibly wealthy well, people? I think, I th no, I mean that would that would not be the kind of sustainable model that that I think any of us would like to see. Um, the one of the founders of the American Journalism Project feels that local journalism and journalism in America is so essential to the health and and um, and sustainability of our democracy that it should be seen as a civic institution. Mm -hmm. And I, I agree with him. Mm -hmm. I actually think that we should think about it mm -hmm. as. as as, um, as a civic good, a public good that should be supported um, by public and private entities. What do you make of the attacks recently from the president? I think he's the key attacker of the Against press. Against the media? <laughs> yeah, the media. Well, when you think I think that. it's right out of a dictator's playbook. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just is. Right? So um, that's, that's actually what people do to, to consolidate power to call into question a narrative that's not their narrative. I think the undermining of the media is, in the last two years is unprecedented and really scary, it should, and everybody should pay attention. And do you think it's working? Yeah, I do, I do. I think, um, well, if you, look at, if you look at polls about, um, and you probably know this better than mm -hmm. I, but at, at the degree to which people trust the, any news source and they trust even, um, you know, highly credible fact-checking organizations um, and their reporting, uh, it's at an all-time low and, and shockingly low. Uh, it doesn't help, though, that, that I think some, some media entities play into this where, it, you know, we just saw it with BuzzFeed where there's sort of, you know, there's a rush to have breaks before, before everything's truly deeply vetted mm -hmm. and that plays into Trump's uh, rhetoric Mm -hmm. And so we should be careful about that, or so you guys should. Does, does that mean more? <laughs> Thank you. I'll try harder. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty accurate. It's my brand kind of thing. Yeah, you have. Uh, I mean, yeah. no, I, I have sunglasses to say, and accuracy yeah, that, and obnoxiousness. And she did wear the sunglasses in Soul Cycle. I did. And it's a dark room. Yeah, it's yeah. a dark room. Yeah. <laughs> I thought what happens in Soul Cycle stays in Soul Cycle, the rain. I look cool. That's 
cool. You did. Yeah. You did. Um, I'm getting back to journalism. So, so I want to finish with the media. Do you expect to make more media? Because you know, in this, do you expect to make online? Do you think of online and offline differently? And do you expect to make more? There were rumors that you were going to invest in the New York Times. I think I started, you that, started rumor that rumor myself. Yeah, I know that. That wasn't me. <laughs> okay. But no. would you, do you think of bigger things like like a Jeff Bezos like purchase? Not the other um, part of his life, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, dear. Come on. Oh, I know, I know. But you, you, you got to love that he embraced the media covering it, too. Yeah, he so, did. Um, yeah. yeah, there is that. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, actually, I, I do, now that, now that we have um, a, sort of a, a really beautiful portfolio of properties that I think are are super high quality and important journalism. Um, I'm, I'm open to I'm open to more. Mm -hmm. uh, I I do think the more should come in the form more like the American Journalism Project, where there's there's a fund that will support great local ownership and sustainability and find another model rather than rather than just you know, rich people accumulating properties, that's not so interesting, and it's not sustainable either. Right, right, that's a good point. Um, I want one more question on this topic. When you think of the media, is it gonna have to all be online? Do you see? Uh, no, I don't think so, I don't think so. I, I well, um, I love print myself. I think that, I think that the demise of, of print and books is, um, is not accurate, I think, well, you know, there's sort of this asymptotic slope, but I think it goes down to about 25% of people who consume media consume it through print, and mm -hmm. that's what that's where we'll end up. That's um, I don't think I don't think everything needs to live online, um, and I think there are a lot of people who love the tactile mm -hmm. um, portability of print in that way and want to you know tuck it in their bag or under their arm. Now, one of the, your partners in the American Journalism Problem is Facebook giving away some $300 million to local, they're in that American journalism. It's kind of interesting that the, the Google and Facebook are putting money into this. It's kind of like the arsonist paying to build the house. That's my, that's my quote. Oh yeah, there, okay. there, there are other analogies too. Right, yeah. <laughs> Do you, can they help? Or should they help, given they sucked up? I mean, they, okay. Here's something really interesting. Here's, a, here's something that, that used to just drive me mad, which is um, philanthropists, and I use that word because I'm, I'm thinking of people who, who put all their wealth into um, a foundation um, and built out a philanthropy, would use 5% a year of their payout of the corpus to do good work, and then they ignored how the 95% was invested and often those two things were at odds with each other. Right. You know, they would very happily not look at the environmental degradation of the 95%. You know, they were invested in, in coal and oil and extractive resources. And then on this side, they're trying to address, um, you know, environmental injustice and degradation and the fact that climate change is happening. Um, and they never put those two things together. It's sort of like this lobotomy took over. Mm -hmm. So I think in this way, they're not using the power of their corpus in that right. way. That's um, really so what they really need to do is look at is look at their algorithms and look at the biases behind it, and they have to look at what they're allowing to happen on their platforms and take responsibility for it. Yeah, that would be nice, Lorraine. That would be great. That's my goal. Um, so let's go into storytelling, because another thing you're doing is a lot of activity around immigration, which is another... Uh, big topic and one of the things you're doing is you're trying to hit activism in a very different way using artists um, I don't know if any of you have seen this amazing thing and you use technology to do this. It's Carney E Arena um, It's a VR experience of, uh, of being on the border. It's really yeah. it's yeah. It, talk about this because yeah. why are you doing this? Why are you funding things like this? I found it incredibly moving using art and, yeah. the, and technology. Um, I think I think we're we're entering a golden age of art and activism and the blending of the two. It's really exciting. Yeah. Um, Here's a picture of so, it. Yeah. Um, so, so we were approached by Alejandro and he was, he was workshopping a VR experience and so um, he won, it was the first time that he was directing in VR and he had a story that he wanted to tell. He went around to um, agencies in Los Angeles and talked to people who had 
across the border and talk to them about their experiences and why they came. And uh, he used the actual individuals as the characters in his experience. And it's a beautiful, immersive experience that allows you to be on the southern border crossing into the United States with a group of people, and you're apprehended by Border Patrol. And um, it's incredibly chilling and um, deeply affecting. And it's one of those experiences that once, once you have had it, it never will leave you. Yep. I don't know if you felt that way when you went through it. Yeah. Um, it's, like, it's like one of those epiphanies where the veil drops and you now see and you can never unsee it. Uh, and, and we thought it was so important that not only did we um, want to invest in the VR project, but we brought it to Washington, D.C. Right. And we ran it. Actually, if you show that picture one more time... Um, it just, it go? Yeah, there Put it up. is. So we renovated this. This old church was set for to be demolished, and um, and so we worked with the city, and they held off the demolition for a year, and then we used this these pieces of corrugated metal that were that were picked up from the border, and um, so people had so to walk through that's it. That's the wall. That's the wall right that's there. That's pieces of the wall. All right. Yeah. Okay. I think. Well, they, you yeah. you built the wall. Then. <laughs> <laughs> just for a second. And for a good I, cause. Yeah, I, I, well, we we um, we deconstructed some walls, and yeah. then we wanted people to see what they're talking about. These are twenty foot tall things. Um, and anyway, um, the the experience was visited by over nine thousand people in D.C. over a period of seven months. A lot of elected officials and their staffs, and um, a lot of journalists mm -hmm. and. It, I think it was tremendous. We're now looking for other cities to bring it to. Um, we have a, we're trying to retool the experience so that it can, we can have Move it more, around. more people, so it can be more portable and we can have more people so go through it. So art and activism, you also had large pictures. You had a photographer that took giant pictures and you, you put them outside of like Mitch McConnell's office. You put oh, them, yeah. 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 <laughs> like you, you put giant yeah, yeah. photographs of immigrants all over the place. And, yeah. on the, and yeah. then you were... <laughs> <laughs> I, I like. Let me just tell you, I love when a woman gets a lot of money. I just and then because you use it, you're using it for like these things. So you took pictures. You also did one yes. on the border. You had a baby looking that over. Was, that was Jr.'s installation, right. and um, yes, we worked with him to install that. And that photo of the baby on the border was seen uh, over a billion times. So right. that's sort of the really beautiful power of of art meets um, social media. So what what is why are you doing it that way? Because there's other ways you could do it. I mean, you obviously well, have a new actually, presence in Washington. You have a big. You know, I th I think of it as sort of all these arrows in the quiver. Right. So, so we use philanthropy, we use policy, cause, so we have, we have great policy people in D.C. Uh, we use arts, we use investing in companies, um, we actually do convenings, we do, really, and I like to do for myself, I really like to do sort of the under the radar, more skunk works type stuff. Yeah, including yeah. visiting people in the Trump administration, correct, to talk about immigration and these issues. Well, yeah. Yeah, how did that yeah. go? That was actually with President Trump. Um, well, as you can see, he repealed DACA, yeah. which is what we met about, um, so it didn't work very well. Yeah, yeah. so what does that happen But he said, he said, I really like your dress. He <laughs> <laughs> did, I know. That was, yeah, yeah, I, and I thought, the things I will do, you know, just, yeah. But, what did you say um, then? I said, God, I'm so glad I wasn't there, because I'd be like, you're fucking kidding me. <laughs> That's why you should go, always go everywhere. You know what? I should have been a billionaire. I really should have. It would have been so good. I could have been. I, could, I was there. I could have been. Is that right? Yes, it was. Yes, I was, I was offered a job at Google when they had like six people. Hmm. Same thing at Amazon. Yeah. I said, huh. why would I want to do that? I'm a reporter. <laughs> Anyway, well, we'll get into that That's later. That's good. No, I'm glad. I'm no, glad you did so, it. Now you're, so, you're so, your own brand. So, so what do you imagine is going to change DACA and, and, and that? What has to go? So you didn't, dress thing didn't work. What, 2020. 2020, what do you think is going to have to happen? 2020 is exactly right, but go ahead. Oh, well, I mean, I, I think 
we're all hands on deck. Uh, mm -hmm. We have we have to we have to have new leadership at, at this country. I mean, there's actually so much destruction that has happened that needs to be repaired. Um, there's been decimation across agencies. I think um, the problems are far more profound than any of us, even everybody who's paying attention, really are grasping. So we need we need someone who can both fix and rebuild and lead and leapfrog us forward. Right. So Absolutely. we need great leadership. Okay, if anybody has a question for Lorraine, we have just a few minutes for it. Let's see if does anyone have any questions? Oh, Hands up. Come on, right here. Right here, put it up. We're going to do that. Um, stand up here and then I'm going to ask one more question about education because that's the last thing that she's really focused on. You can also ask a question of Kara. Yeah, no you can't. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. Um, I am a choreographer and a musician, and um, as someone working in the intersection of technology and art, there can be this feeling of like needing to be chosen in order to get access to any resources to make art. And I'm just wondering, um, from, from your end, like what would you say to artists who are trying to make work that's really relevant and also can break through and be seen as something that's worthy of funding? Mm. Um, one of my best friends is Brenda Way, and she started ODC here in San Francisco 35 years ago. And um, yeah, she, she, she started out of a bus, and you know uh, how artists, unfortunately, um, are not highly valued at the moment, and so, so they have to make do. But um, her art took off, started small, and um, and grew into something that's that's a real cultural institution for the city. And I think that the lesson there is is. It does take time sometimes, and sometimes there's um, a lot of struggle before there's breakthrough. Um, but I, you know, I think social media, while it can be a tool for um, destruction and division, is also a, a tool for access and connection. And so, luckily, you live at a time where you can put your, you can have more people see your art than otherwise would come and stumble upon it in person. Um, but I think being both a musician and a choreographer is a very cool thing because it probably, uh, having both, um, both artistic outlets probably make you better at each thing. Um, so that's, that's exciting. Maybe LWT will have you perform and then you'll get, you'll get a lot <laughs> of awesome. eyeballs. Yeah. That. All right. Any more questions? Questions? From anyone? This large crowd. All right, I have two more things I want to talk about. One is edu your uh, commitment to education. Mm -hmm. uh, I visited College Track with you um, yeah. when, when, a couple of years, it was two years ago. Yeah. Um, how do you, how does that fit in? Because one of the things talking about earlier is making connections between things. Oh, well, College Track is um, an organization that I started over 20 years ago. And um, <clears throat> it was, it was actually, the first time that I was in the social sector, it was the first time that that I knew anything about um, the role of nonprofits in civil society and building bridges and and being um, agents for change in that way. Uh, and I also learned a lot about what it's like to to go and ask people for money. We're a public mm -hmm. charity, and so you need a multiplicity of funding sources and um, and. I understood so many things about how to be a good philanthropist by being uh, by being the executive director of a nonprofit, um, and this organization, which is still going strong and serving over 3,000 students this year, um, we were we were built because I came, I went to speak to um, a senior class in a local high school here in California. It was the first time I had been in a California high school because I didn't grow up here. And, um, and I was shocked, truly, at the lack of access to information about college and anything after high school. And this was to a class of students who are self-selected into this class because they wanted to go to college. And um, not a single one of them had taken the SATs and they were already seniors. And then um, I just got so outraged in one class visit where I was, it was supposed to be just telling them about what it's like to be 
an entrepreneur, I decided that I would come back every week and I would be their college counselor because they had never seen one before. And of the 35 students, 33 had not taken the courses they needed to take to even apply to a college. And, and I was so offended and outraged on their behalf that I ended up you know, selling the for-profit company I was running and just started this organization um, to see if I could be helpful and if I could be of use. And it's everything I've learned and everything that we ended up creating was and is informed by the students of, and families of College Track. Great. And my last question, speaking of that, One of the reasons I do like talking to you is because you seem more woke than most people in Silicon Valley, i got to tell you. Um, That's a low bar. They're all, exactly, it's a low bar. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you for saying that. It's really low. Um, how do you get the bar? Do you, look, it's been a reckoning this year. They've gotten the crap kicked out of them deservedly. You've been around these people forever. You know them. What does it take for them to start to behave more like you and less like themselves? <laughs> what, have they gotten it? I mean, otherwise, let's just take all their money, do the Ocasio method and just take all their money. Like, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Yours so, too, sorry. No, it's not. <laughs> I mean, either way, either way, it's, it's going. Right. Um, so, um, I think, I think Brian Stevenson, who's such a brilliant and beautiful human being, um, talks a lot about proximity, and, and I believe that. Um, I think I, it's, it's not my nature to want to live in a bubble, but it's actually a very easy thing to do, um, mm -hmm. and I think that's actually one of the many detriments of excess wealth, is it allows you to live in a bubble, and uh, so I, I don't think you can actually change unless you have proximity, mm -hmm. and, um, and so you have to, if you're in a bubble, you have to pop it, and you have to walk out of it, and you have to make yourself uncomfortable, and you actually need to, be open to learning and changing, and most people are not. Do you think they will? I like, I think the chances are better now than they were a year ago. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I think that they're, you know, sometimes you need to get hit across the head with a frying pan, and then, then you realize, oh, then I need to change. Um, so I think there's gonna be some forcing of changing, and I think um, maybe those who come from, who, who come behind them, um, are a little, will learn from their mistakes and not slip into the bubbles. All right, Lorraine Powell, thank you.